just five years ago, my total pre-tax income was less than $20,000. And last year, my pre-tax income was more than $300,000. Today, I am breaking down the winding road I took to increasing my income. Everything from side hustles to contract work to freelancing to starting my own little operation. And if you're trying to increase your income or you're just curious, today's episode probably has a nugget or two of hot and spicy takes for you. Welcome back to the Money with Katie show, Rich Girls and Boys. And today we are diving into what I am colloquially referring to as my income journey because it makes it sound more mythic and cool. I'm your host, Katie Gaddy Tossan. Now, I want to clarify up front that I think it's mildly dicey territory to take specific things that worked for an N of one and attempt to deduce broadly applicable themes as generalized advice or takeaways. But to the extent my income journey is useful or inspiring or sparks an idea or two for someone, we're going to walk down that meandering path today. And as if I were an elected official running for re-election, I'm going to use my tax returns as helpful guidance to make sure I am being as accurate as possible. It's going to be all pre-tax income we're talking today as reported to the IRS. We stand a documentation queen. Hashtag form 1040. Before we get into it today, I wanted to mention that the 2023 Wealth Planner ah, launches at midnight tomorrow, November 25th. So excited. This is the first year we hired an Excel freelancer to help beef her up, and I'm really pumped about some of the enhancements we've made. I'll link more information in the description, but this is the Money with Katie flagship product, and I am proud to say it is the best it has ever been. All right, let's start with high school and college, because I've always found those life income recaps that include someone's first six-figure business. They started their junior year of high school selling charm bracelets to unsuspecting middle schoolers to be hella demoralizing. At the time, I was mostly concerned with concealing my cystic acne and not getting caught schlepping bottles of pink lemonade burnettes to Molly's house in high school. All that to say, fortunately for you, my income journey does not begin there. I, uh, I did work part-time, making $7.25 an hour at a daycare and a gym. Fun. But I usually spent that money right away on gas and trips to Applebee's on half-price appetizers. Wish I were kidding. Uh, in fact, my income journey doesn't really begin in earnest until after college. I worked two different part-time jobs in college, one during the school year for $8 an hour for a real estate marketing company and another internship between junior and senior year that paid $12 an hour. I mostly blew through that money immediately on $20 bar covers and uh, Tuscaloosa's hottest boutique fashion. So by the time I graduated, I had less than, well, less than a thousand dollars to my name, but crucially no debt. I attended a public state university on a full tuition scholarship and my parents covered room and board. So I was incredibly fortunate to be in the minority of students. I think it's like 39% who graduate from college without any debt. In some ways, the fact that I could blow through all my part-time income in my teens and early 20s is less a like flippant admission of my own irresponsibility and more a function of the fact that my basic needs were met by my parents. I didn't have to learn to budget because I was not accountable for providing my own food and shelter, and that in itself is a tremendous privilege. But that all changed once I crossed the graduation stage. So let's pick this story back up in 2017. After graduating, I got a postgrad internship, again, making $12 an hour for the same Fortune 500 company. And as anyone who's attempted to pay their rent in the 21st century knows, $12 an hour is not enough to live on. After taxes, my take-home pay was around $1,400 a month. That summer, I benefited greatly from the generosity of a friend's empty nester aunt and uncle. Without her relatives, I would not have been able to afford to take that job. My friend had landed a similar internship with similarly low pay at the same company, so we both lived in our aunt and uncle's spare bedroom for the summer. And the deal was that once the summer ended, we needed to have real jobs and move out. Fortunately for her, she scored her full-time position at the company first, earning a bewildering sum of money. $52,000. And when she told me her starting salary, my jaw dropped. After graduating with a communications degree, I was hopeful that I would earn 45 k on the high side. 
uh, 52K might as well have been 520K. I was envious. Simultaneously, it did give me this number to anchor to, and I started to wonder whether it would be possible for me to get a salary that high too. So that summer was spent going above and beyond to catch the attention of someone, anyone with decision-making power, because I desperately wanted a full-time job and desperately wanted it at that company. The office environment was pretty casual, but I still tended to be that tryhard who was always dressed up, always there early, always seeking out work from other teams in an attempt to impress anyone who would like look in my direction for six seconds. And to my absolute delight, all the sucking up worked. I lucked into a really fantastic manager who advocated for me when it came time to determine if any of the open positions would be a good fit and a director level colleague took notice of my work. She called me into her office on Friday afternoon and informally offered me the copywriter role on our team starting at the level above entry. To this day, it was one of the happiest, most surreal, gratifying moments of my entire life. It felt like all the corporate jockeying and worrying that I had done for the past two summers actually worked. And when the recruiter called to formally offer me the position, she said the same number that I had been clinging to since my friend received her offer, $52,000. And bizarrely, that is also the same day I met my now husband, Thomas. I went to meet a friend after work to celebrate, and he was there. So like a life-changing day all around. Over the moon was an understatement. At that moment, I felt richer than at least three of the Kardashians. Sorry, Rob. I started my job that year in late September, and between my internship earnings and a couple months of full-time work, my 2017 pre-tax earnings were $19,252. We'll be right back after a message from the sponsors of today's episode. Having a rich girl mindset is about being curious. Curious about money, sure, but curious about the world around you, too. Now... Picture a group of people coming together to learn about and taste some of the best wines via fun, curated experiences. And yet, none of them keep their noses so high up in the air that you can see their boogers. That is exactly who Vin Social is for. It brings together the best people who love to learn about wine through shared experiences, minus the stuffy energy. Vin Social members can pair a 1990s Chablis with 90s hip hop while getting introduced to a world of wine from diverse, female owned, and sustainable small batch winemakers that deliver the good stuff to your door. Now, that sounds like a good time. You can access these exciting initiatives and bottles of the good stuff with the Grand Crew membership. You can learn more at vinsocialvip.com. That's vinsocialvip.com. Moving on to 2018. So 2018 was another year of mostly the same. That spring, about six months into working full-time, I was given a 3% merit increase. This was mostly just the inflation adjustment that everyone received, but I was still really excited about it. My salary went up to 53,560, and I received a small cash bonus that year of around $600. This was also the year that I became a yoga instructor for a big name corporate yoga conglomerate. You probably know the one. And I earned $12 an hour teaching classes. So I went through this 100 hour training in the spring. It was $1,000 and started teaching two classes per week in the summer. This was my first side hustle, and it was valuable to me for three reasons. Number one, it opened up my eyes to one's ability to earn money outside of one's full-time job. I will never forget a conversation I had with a particularly ambitious, cool older girl colleague at my full-time job who mentioned that she babysat the children of rich people every night after work to supplement her income. And I remember asking like, wait, but you have a full-time job already. Why do you, why do you need to have part-time jobs too? And her response made me feel accurately like a person who had not yet come to terms with the reality of wage stagnation. <gasps> Uh, to make extra money? Only a few months into working full-time myself, it had not yet occurred to me that this was an option on the table and I wanted in. Number two, it made me realize how much free time I had. I adjusted quickly to my new schedule, which was one class at 6 a.m. on Tuesdays before work and then another class at 6.45 p.m. on Thursdays after work. And I noticed I kind of felt bored 
on the evenings where I wasn't teaching. By this point, my like post-grad working girl happy hour obsession had subsided and I found myself spending a lot of time in my apartment watching TV. So paradoxically, teaching two classes per week made me notice all the other free time I had in my schedule outside of my nine to five. And number three, it introduced me to my love of fitness and consequently getting hashtag fit for free. Making an incremental $12 an hour twice per week was not life-changing money for my medium cost of living area, but the gig came with a free membership to the studio worth $140 a month, as well as standby access to other studios in the area, allowing me to try other formats that were previously way out of my range of comfortable affordability, like Barry's Boot Camp and SoulCycle. Crucially, this made me realize that taking a part-time job in an industry I liked patronizing as a customer could serve the financial double whammy of supplementing my income a little bit and helping me save a lot on things I'd be paying for anyway. When all was said and done in 2018, I earned $54,108 from my full-time job and $852 from teaching fitness or $54,960 total. 2019, that was the year that a lot of groundwork for my current situation was laid. So after successfully shamelessly campaigning for a raise at work. I had been kind of doing the job of two copywriters for the last year and a half, uh, as the headcount had never been filled for my complimentary employee. My salary was increased to a staggering 60,000. And I was thrilled, especially since I had fully prepared myself for many, many years of earning in the $40,000 range, thanks to average comms salaries at the time. So I was growing increasingly comfortable and connected in the fitness community in my city. I was now teaching three classes a week. I still remember my schedule. It was Tuesday, 6 a.m., Wednesday, 5.30 p.m., and Thursday, 7.15 a.m. And was also growing increasingly interested in spin as a format after attending a bunch of free soul cycle classes. So that spring, I auditioned to teach cycling at another studio in town. And after training commenced, I continued to train while teaching my three classes per week until eventually it was just not doable anymore. And for a couple months, I was no longer teaching yoga sculpt, but I had not yet hit the cycle schedule. So my side hustle income kind of went away for a little bit. Around this time though, my obsession with personal finance was reaching a fever pitch. And I started doing little coaching consultations with friends, acquaintances, colleagues. So for like 50 bucks an hour, I would spend a few hours reviewing someone's income, spending and debt and build a budget and teach the basics of investing in like a 401k and Roth IRA. I supplemented my income with this little tiny consulting business, mornings, evenings, weekends, whenever I wasn't at work or in cycle training. Finally, in October, I got onto the schedule teaching two classes per week, Monday, 7.45 p.m and Thursday 5 30 p.m and the classes actually paid an outrageously higher sum than my previous teaching gig it was $25 per class plus two dollars a head meaning you could earn $125 for a full 45 minute class which was a far cry from the $12 a class I had earned at the aforementioned yoga conglomerate so all told, in 2019, I earned $60,656 from my full-time job and $2,085 from teaching cycle. 62741 pre-tax total. I, uh, I'm not sure how much I earned from consulting because I didn't really do it very often or charge very much and didn't have any tax forms associated with it. It was a pretty informal Venmo op, but uh, pretty sure it generated less than $500 overall. Sorry, IRS. When I say 2019 laid the groundwork, I'm mostly referring to the fact that I finally felt like I was earning real money from my side hustle, several hundred per month, which with a take-home pay of around 3,000 from my full-time job was relatively substantial. It also was the first time I realized I could charge another individual for a service or product rendered and was probably my first taste of entrepreneurship on a very micro scale. 2020. Ah, 2020, the year where it is both painfully true and flagrantly false to claim that nothing happened. Now working from home and unable to teach in-person classes, I was chomping at the bit to do something, anything, with my newfound abundance of free time and simultaneously pretty concerned about money. 
I was supposed to be promoted that April, needless to say, that did not happen, and had just bought a new car, so I was feeling pretty vulnerable financially. Money with Katie historians, all one of you, hi Hannah, will know this is around the time moneywithkatie.com was born in April 2020. At that point, it was just a project, little hobby, didn't make any money, so it didn't take long for me to go scouring for extra work, most of which didn't amount to anything, until I found an hourly contract job doing the same thing I did for full-time work toward the end of summer that paid really well. So I cleared it with management and my full-time employer began doing extra contract work on the side. And by June, the studio had reopened because Texas. So I was resuming earning money from teaching again regularly. The small business had also received a PPP loan. So I actually continued to receive paychecks in April and May, despite not teaching. That was an enormous relief as I had come to rely on those side hustle checks. My schedule in 2020 was really all over the place. For the majority of the year, I was teaching three classes per week, blogging on Money with Katie for fun, working full time from home, taking on freelance projects for friends, and then working hourly on the side. I got really, really good at time management because I had to be. And in retrospect, I'm not really sure how I did all of it. Okay, that's a lie. I know how I did it. I had no children, no social life, and I drank a lot of coffee. But 2020 was when things really started picking up for me and I realized my income limitations were somewhat imaginary. Being freed from the daily commute and 40 hours per week in an office building, I was given the privilege of seeing my time as endlessly monetizable, which is a blessing and a curse, my therapist says. So by the end of 2020, I had earned 64,121 from my full-time job, 13,489 from hourly contract work and freelancing, and 12,475 from teaching fitness, or a total of $90,085. Unfortunately, my tax form also reveal that I ended up owing $4,920 in taxes, mostly because the hourly contract work didn't withhold anything and the fitness gig didn't withhold enough. So by this time, I was inching closer and closer to the six-figure mark and I was becoming really, really obsessed with generating extra income. I had nothing better to do and it started to feel like a game. By year end, I'd been doing Money with Katie as a side project for about eight months, and I wanted to launch my first product, The Wealth Planner, the fourth iteration of which launches in a day. So that brings us to 2021. In 2021, I doubled down on everything, with the exception of teaching fitness, because I moved to another state, didn't find a comparable studio, so I kind of let that go. With my weekends, nights, and early mornings now freed up from going to a studio, I had plenty of time to channel into my full-time job, hourly contract work, and turning money with Katie into something that would generate actual revenue. About halfway through the year, I switched companies. I figured the road to recovery for my pandemic-affected industry was going to be long, and my single largest source of income was limited. As a result, pivoted to tech, and after several failed interviews and ghosted resumes, I finally landed a job with a new salary of $115,000. On the Money with Katie front, I released an episode a few months ago entitled Building a Six-Figure Side Hustle that goes into detail about exactly how I monetized Money with Katie, but the TLDR is Money with Katie became my largest source of income in 2021. While I had worked part-time doing contract work and continued to work full-time throughout the first half of 2021 while building Money with Katie, by the time I switched to my higher-paying full-time job, I decided to stop working part-time and only focus on two things, my new full-time job and money with Katie. Between my two full-time jobs, so one in the first half of the year and the higher paying job in the second half of the year, I earned $96,379 and then another $34,867 from the hourly contract work in the beginning of the year before stopping. And here's the big one, $241,016 from money with Katie before taxes. Like I said, for the breakdown of revenue and how I scaled, check out that six-figure side hustle episode because it's super in-depth. But in total, 2021 pre-tax, it was around $372,262. So I owed about 40 grand in back taxes on my business income. So call it like 332 in take-home pay. I don't know. Another sidebar, one of my earliest episodes was about ways to lower taxes on self-employment income. The production quality is terrible, but the content is great. So 
check that episode out too. I would have owed a lot more had I not instituted the practices in that episode. We'll be right back after a message from the sponsors of today's episode. And now from our sponsors. Paid non-client of Betterment. Views may not be representative. See more reviews at the App Store and Google Play Store. Learn more about this relationship at betterment.com slash moneywithkatie. Today's Money with Katie episode is brought to you by Betterment. I would never dismiss your concerns surrounding market volatility. What I will tell you is that personalized investing was built for days like these. Betterment can help you make a plan tailored to your goals to help you make the most out of your money. They offer expert-built portfolios that you can select based on your interests and the issues that matter to you, like social justice or innovative tech portfolio. And with automated rebalancing, your portfolio can stay diversified at your chosen risk level. Sign up in minutes at betterment.com slash moneywithkatie. That's B-E-T-T-E-R-M-E-N-T dot com slash moneywithkatie. You'll thank you later. Today's Money with Katie episode is brought to you by Capitalize. It's the most wonderful time of the year to start getting your finances in order. But between figuring out your gift budget, open enrollment, and spending those use it or lose it health funds, you don't want your old 401ks getting lost in the shuffle. Or you may lose out on hundreds of thousands of dollars in retirement savings. Literally. Capitalize can make your next 401k rollover completely stress-free by managing the whole process from start to finish. And they do it for free. I have done three rollovers with Capitalize myself, and they help track down your old 401k accounts, choose the best IRA to meet your needs, and help you take control of your retirement savings for life. Start maximizing your savings ahead of the new year and get your rollover started at highcapitalize.com slash moneywithkatie. That's H-I-C-A-P-I-T-A-L-I-Z-E dot com slash moneywithkatie. A quick disclosure, Capitalize does not provide investment or tax advice. Visit highcapitalize.com slash moneywithkatie for details. We all rest in our own way. You've got your starfish sleepers, your side sleepers, maybe a few stomach sleepers, that's me. A lot of people alternate sleep positions throughout the night, which means they need a mattress that adapts to each movement. Well, friends, the dream of having a mattress that moves with you can come true. Purple mattresses are made with the gel flex grid that instantly adapts as you move to support any position your body curls into. And since the gel flex grid doesn't trap body heat, these mattresses will keep you cool all night long. Are you ready to experience restorative sleep? I thought so. Visit a purple showroom or try out a 100 night no pressure trial with fast and free shipping. Head over to purple.com to learn more. That's purple.com. Let's bring it all home. I have no idea what my final income in 2022 will be. Obviously, I don't have any of those tax forms yet, but now I only do money with Katie and other money with Katie related things. And for me personally, increasing my income meant trying a smattering of approaches, switching companies, freelancing in my traditional career field, doing part-time work in a completely different industry, starting my own business twice. I hope this episode highlights two very crucial things. There was certainly sacrifice and hard work involved, no doubt. But there was also a fair bit of luck that I wrote about in this past Monday's blog post. We'll link it in the show notes. That's partially why it's challenging to say any one takeaway is broadly applicable or perfectly replicable. It was a lot of trial and error. Taken together, though, I think it paints the picture of diversifying effort, making the best decisions we can with the information available to us at the time. Only one of the things mentioned ended up being singularly high income generating with a lot of upside. But it's important to remember that no two paths are the same. It is probably reasonable to assume that had I stuck with a career in tech or really doubled down on building a personal brand around being a fitness instructor or something else entirely, that eventually any one of those things could have had the potential to pan out into a similarly successful venture. That's just not what happened for me, so far at least. The thing that panned out brought with it an opportunity that introduced some semblance of stability and longevity via the morning brew acquisition and contract, and I had a choice to make about which direction I wanted to take. And of course, the story is not over yet. I have no idea whether or not I'll look back on this someday and feel like I made the right decision. I'm still figuring things out as I go, and for right now, it does feel like the best decision. But like I said, we can only make decisions with the information we have available to us at the time. So to close, I want to talk about making your own luck. This is the mantra that has really stuck with me since college. Make your own luck. 
It sounds like a worst hits compilation of woo-woo mindset and grind set culture, but its origin story in my life may explain why it has been so sticky. My senior year of college, it felt like the prior four years of extracurricular activities and studying were finally paying off in a couple big ways, and I called my dad one day, rife with imposter syndrome, and divulged oh my God, I feel like I'm just getting really, really lucky right now. Like I have this fear that the other shoe is about to drop. I'm afraid my luck is going to run out. What if this is the most success I'm ever going to have in my life? Like what if it's all downhill from here? Cause I've just gotten really lucky. And what he told me stuck with me. He said, well, it might be, maybe it is, but maybe you can make your own luck. And it gave me a sense of control that has helped me keep my head down and keep going when things feel challenging. I'm making my own luck, I would tell myself as I was driving across town at 4.45 a.m. to teach a 5.30 class, or as I would stay up late writing a blog post for a website that had yet to earn any money. Whether that sense of control was false or not, it certainly incentivized me to keep going. There is, of course, the element of luck that is inherited from various socioeconomic factors. Growing up as the only child of two college-educated working parents who emphasized the importance of education, both psychologically and financially, I did nothing to deserve that. I just benefited from it. But like I said in the beginning, it's not necessarily accurate to take specific things that worked for one person, in this case me, and claim that they make great applicable advice or takeaways for everybody. But I am hopeful that there's at least one nugget in here that may serve someone else who is hoping to increase their income or at the very least satiate your curiosity about how I ended up in the position I'm in now. And if this episode works for you in the same way that the conversation with that older babysitting coworker did for me, then that is a W in my book. Rich Girl Roundup. Love it. Welcome back to Rich Girl Roundup. We take listener questions every month on the Money with Katie Instagram account and answer it from a what would Katie do POV. I am not a licensed financial professional, and this is not financial advice. And now from our sponsors. Paid non-client of Betterment, views may not be representative. See more reviews at the App Store and Google Play Store. Learn more about this relationship at betterment.com slash moneywithkatie. This segment is brought to you by Betterment, the online investing platform that gives you the tools, inspiration, and support that will help you become a better investor. This week's question is from Haley. My husband works a government job with great retirement benefits. He loves his work and doesn't have the fire desire like I do. Is there a way to run the calculations for a pension and lifelong health insurance plus steady income through his work? I want to retire early. Okay, Haley, you and I are on the same page here. Uh, I also have a husband who works a government job, so we are kindred spirits. I am struck by this question because while we are approaching it as a fire exercise, what it really boils down to is the relatively common family question, which is, can we afford to drop down to a single income and still retire? So the first question I have is, is the income you will be retaining enough to support you both with your current standard of living? That will make a big difference in the answer today. So let's break down this question into a few different components. We have the pension aspect, we have the healthcare aspect, and we have the continuing steady income aspect. So each facet of the situation will impact it a little bit differently, but I think the first important step is determining how much our lives cost, and by extension, how much income we need to produce after we fire completely. For the sake of the example, I'm going to use $5,000 per month in expenses. Nice round number. So if your life costs $5,000 per month in 2022 dollars, that means your income, either from work or from investments, needs to spin off at least 5000 per month after taxes for you to comfortably live your life adjusted for inflation. Though we'll get to the inflation part in a little bit. Of course, that assumes our expenses right now are representative of what they're going to continue to be in the future. So for example, if we plan to have three children between now and then, our expenses will change. Likewise, if we already have three children and they're about to be out on their own, 
our expenses are also probably going to change. This is part of the underlying challenge of FIRE more broadly, that as your circumstances change, often so do your expenses. Healthcare is part of this uncertainty conundrum in the U.S. fun, though in this case it almost cancels itself out. Having healthcare now and later means your health expenses actually may not change very dramatically after firing anyway. So it's difficult to plan for these things perfectly, but we can give ourselves some broad frameworks to think about this. Speaking about the pension first, assuming your spouse will receive the pension, things can always change, of course, but if you are working the standard amount of years for the U.S. government, you're probably going to be fine. We can probably pinpoint an estimate for when the pension will kick in and how much of our $5,000 per month spending it'll provide. What's important about FIRE is having enough sources of income to provide for our expenses, right? So let's contextualize how much the pension component is worth. For example, I don't know how much your pension is going to be worth, but if we know we're gonna get $1,500 a month from a pension, that's $18,000 per year, which is roughly equivalent to having a stock portfolio worth $450,000. We can calculate this by multiplying $18,000, the annual income from the pension, by 25 to understand what number $18,000 represents 4% of, right? So we're really just taking the inverse of the 4% rule. This is great because it's $450,000 that we no longer need to save and invest in order to have that $18,000 chunk of annual income. Now, in this situation, the earner who will be providing the steady income will also be the earner who provides the pension. So theoretically, this means we will never have both at once. The pension will replace the steady income when the earner leaves work. So this leaves us with our original major question. Is your spouse's income high enough to support your $5,000 a month spending? If yes, that means we just need to save and invest enough before retiring early such that it'll grow sufficiently by the time our spouse retires to be able to supplement our pension income and provide for all of our living expenses in retirement, assuming the pension alone is not enough. Now, in this example, with some of these fake numbers that I'm using, we need our investments to produce about $3,000. $500 per month, yeah, in 2022 dollars to supplement the pension. If it does not, right, like if we uh, don't have enough income from the job that we're retaining to support our living expenses, it means that we need to save and invest enough before retiring early such that our investments can both make up the difference between what our spouse is earning and what we need to spend before traditional retirement age and still have enough left over when our spouse retires to supplement the pension. Using our $5,000 per month figure, we know that our FI number is around 1.5 million, like a portfolio worth 1.5 million will usually safely spin off $60,000 in income per year or 5,000 a month. But we know we don't need the full 1.5 million because we have this hypothetical pension that's worth $450,000, right? Because it's producing 18,000 per year, dropping us down to about $1,050,000, which will provide the other $42,000 per year. Now, it just comes down to our spouse's income. If their income is more than enough to cover our living expenses until traditional retirement, great. We just need to invest enough such that it grows to an inflation adjusted 1050000 by the time we hit traditional retirement age and the pension kicks in. How old we are and therefore how much time we have before real retirement age and how much we earn now are both crucial factors in being able to determine the actual answer to the full equation here, as well as how much we need to adjust upward for inflation, right? Because it determines how many years are going to pass between now and then. But hopefully this framework gives you a sense for how to think about solving this problem in your own life. Of course, things can always change and your husband might decide he does not want to work for the government in two years from now. He might forego the pension and healthcare completely. That would change the situation dramatically. So it's always good to be on the conservative side when making these types of decisions so you don't inadvertently lock yourself into a situation wherein you lose your flexibility. All right, y'all, that is all for this week. Before we go, comment below what you thought the most interesting part of this episode was and remember to like and subscribe to our channel. I will see you next week, same time, same place on The Money with Katie Show. 
Our show is a production of Morning Brew and is produced by Henna Velez and me, Katie Gaddy Tossan. Sarah Singer is our VP of Multimedia, and our video editors are Christy Muldoon and Sebastian Vega. Additional fact-checking comes from Kate Brandt.